Okay, so how is everyone today? Good, I hope. So currently, we've got these two homeworks due right now. Um, there is a quiz running. It's quiz zero, just like written homework zero, which was not really a written homework in the sense that it had a math exercise, but it is for credit. Uh, quiz zero is a how to do a quiz quiz. Okay, so there's no math exercises on it, but it is for credit. So you gotta log on to the testing center webpage, reserve a seat, go to the testing center at the time that you reserve the seat, bring your photo ID, show them your photo ID, sit down, bubble your net ID, that is, that is to say the thing you log into Blackboard with, and your email address thingy, your three initials and then numbers. Bubble that in, and then you've done quiz zero. Okay? So it's a purely mechanical thing. Can you, can you carry out the necessary steps? Okay, quizzes with math exercises begin next week. Any questions about any of that? <clears throat> okay, so last time we were doing section 1.2. Now we're doing section 1.3. And it is called radicals. So, uh, let's just begin. So, this remark defines what a square root is. So, square root. <clears throat> so, the following are equivalent. So that phrase, the following are equivalent, is an exceedingly common phrase in a math class. And so from now on, I'm just going to write the initialism TFAE. Okay, so the following are equivalent. One. Y squared is equal to X and y is positive uh, y is non-negative so that's that's a particular logical situation that we could be in that case and two y is equal to the square root of x so this <coughs> is pronounced the square root of x So notably, th these are enough, as far as the mathematical definition is concerned, but note, in the first place, notice that, notice that because, because x is y squared, because that's the case, what must be true about the SIGN of x? And you might be w asking, why did he just spell that word out? That was weird. Uh, this is a math class, and in math class, there's two very distinct con concepts that are pronounced sign. One of them is S-I-G-N, as in positive and negative, and the other is S-I-N-E, as in sine and cosine. So whenever I'm teaching a class and I'm talking about <coughs> positive and negative, I always just spell it out, S-I-G-N, to make sure that there's no ambiguity. So what must be true about the SIGN of X? It's positive. Okay. I almost agree with that. It's that X has to be zero. there, greater or equal to zero, which is to say non-negative. That's kind of a fine hair to split. It's not positive, it's non-negative. What is, what, what is the distinction between these two? the distinction between positive and non-negative. can also be zero. Right. So, so, 
Positive means greater than zero. Non-negative means greater or equal to zero. <clears throat> okay, so in the first place, condition one implies that x is greater than or equal to zero and condition one implies, not implies, but flat out states that y is greater than or equal to zero. And what this means, to, in a colloquial way to say it, is that the things that you put into the radical are non-negative and the things that come out of the radical are non-negative. Things that go in are non-negative, things that come out are non-negative. So for example, I could ask you and say, well, what's the square root of 9? You could probably just tell me the answer right now. It's 3. How about this? Is the square root of 9 negative 3? No. Why is the square root of 9 not negative 3? <coughs> just because because <laughs> we just got finished defining it in this way. Right? This this note B is 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 reminding you that the things that come out of the radical, right? have to be non-negative. No. The, the square root of 9 is not negative 3. Now, I agree entirely that when you square 3, you get 9. And when you square negative 3, you get 9. I agree entirely with both of those statements. However, the square root of 9 is 3. Not plus or minus 3, not negative 3, 3. Okay. Now, I would never ask you a question so straightforward. I never prompt you with this. But if I did, then this would be the kind of work that you could supply. And so what, what really it is that I'm going to show you, this is sort of like what's happening in your head. Okay, when I say, what's the square root of 9? And you say 3. So the me mechanical procedure that's going on in there is that, okay, square root of 9, not sure what that is. So I'm going to give that a name, x. And then definitionally speaking, I can move the radical to the other side. But when you move the radical to the other side, it changes its shape. When you move the radical to the other side, what does it become? A square, right? So notice that y's are on the left, x's are on the right. Radical here on this side, square on the other side. So when it changes side, it changes shape like this. So what I'm asking for when I say, what's the square root of 9? I'm saying, well, can you please tell me a number that's greater than or equal to 0, such that when you square this number, you get 9? And then all of that happens really quickly in your head, and you just say, 3, and it works. Good. So I could ask, OK, how about, what's the square root of um, 121? Eleven. Okay, because when you, if you were to carry out the multiplication eleven times eleven, what would you get? One twenty-one. Okay. How do you respond? What is the correct response to the following prompt? Good, so I'll say it like this, it's not defined. So why is this not defined? I don't know what imaginary means. Because it must be greater than zero. Yeah, because definitionally speaking, <coughs> definitionally speaking, from a matter of definition, can you put negative things into the radical? You cannot. It's not part of the definition, and therefore this is not defined. Now you say imaginary, we'll get to that later. Okay, but for the time being, the argument, the thing that gets put into the radical, okay, must be non-negative. Okay, how about square root of zero? 
What's this? Zero. The reason why the square root of zero is zero is because, after all, what is zero squared? Zero. Another way to think about this square root of negative 16 issue is that, can you please tell me a number, a real number, that when you square it, you get negative 16? There aren't any real numbers that do that. So that's why it's not defined. Another matter is that I could say, well, how about with your calculator? Calculator. Please give me the square root of 2 to three places past the decimal. OK, well, on my calculator at least, so my calculator looks like that. Uh, if you, you can't see it real good on the camera, but right there, I have an x squared button, and the, the second feature of that button is a radical. So I could type that, and then it shows up like that, and then 2, and there we go. So calculator says square root of 2 is that. So I asked for the first three decimal places, so 1.414. And I'd like to point out that off the top of your head, I, I imagine that you couldn't give me the first 10 decimal places of the square root of 2. Probably not. Right? Whereas, whereas you can definitely do it with like the square root of 9. 3 point as many zeros as you wish. Okay. Now you might wonder, I hope that you do wonder, that when you type that into the calculator, when you type that in the calculator, the calculator comes up with the square root of 2. What if you change it to like 2.1? Will the calculator be able to do that? Sure, right? The calculator will do the square root of any non-negative number that you request of it. How is it doing that? Does it have like magical square root dust inside of it? That just a little bit of it is expended every time you push the button? <laughs> yes, this is precisely what happens. <laughs> so, so no, it's performing a, a mechanical procedure of how, of how to compute the square root of a number. You know, what, Im imagine, what if, it, what if it was the case, you know, that, that you got pulled, if you were on the, just walking down the street, and someone said, right now with pencil and paper, if you can give me the square root of seven to four places past the decimal, I'll give you a million dollars, right here, right now. <laughs> not getting a million. Well, if you wanted to know how to do it, okay, you'll have to take a slightly more advanced math class, but not much more advanced. Or you can come to my office and I'll show you how to do it right there. But it can, it can be done with just arithmetic and just a few steps. Interesting. Okay. <clears throat> so, properties... of the radical. So in the first place, the square root of a product b. So that is to say there is a product, a product b, and it's inside the radical. It's in there. Uh, well, this is the square root of a multiplied by the square root of b. That is to say that the radical distributes across product, just like exponents distribute across products, which we saw on Friday. So there's a slight caveat here, and that is this is true when a is greater than or equal to 0 and b is greater than or equal to 0. Okay, another, another matter that I want to point out <coughs> is that you may, you may notice that I put a little, I put a little uh, hook on the radical. 
Okay, that's usually not typeset in books, but I want to explain to you why I'm doing that, and I want to encourage you to also do it. So the problem is, is an expression like this. What does that mean? Notice how the y is just hanging out just a little bit. It's kind of a little bit under the radical. It's kind of a little bit not under the radical. Is the y in there or is it not? So the problem is, is that it's ambiguous. You don't ever want to put the greater in this situation. You don't ever want to put the greater in the situation where you've written something ambiguous because the, the graders can and will because they've been instructed to assume the worst. Okay? So don't ever do this. Don't ever put the greater in a situation where they have to guess your meaning. Rather, this can mean only one thing, and this can mean only one thing. <coughs> okay, so for example, using this, how about um, the square root of 36? So now, right off the top of your head, I imagine you can just tell me the answer. What is it? Six. Six. Okay, so now I'm going to pretend that I, we didn't know that. So I'm just going to run with that for a moment. And I'd like for you to observe that doesn't 36 factor into 4 times 9? It does. Right? And then the radical just can distribute across that product in the following way. You can say that this is the square root of 4 multiplied by the square root of 9. And then even though I can't remember that 6 squared is 36, maybe I can remember that what the square root of 4 is. Well, what's the square root of 4? 2. And then what's the square root of 9? 3. And then, oh, 6. Okay, and we did a lot of work that I, I don't expect, <laughs> I would never want you to do this, but I wanted to illustrate this with something easy in the, for the first example. Okay, another example would be something like, okay, um, I want you to, I want you to simplify this as much as possible. So like the square root of 12. So by simplify, by simplify, I want you to make it to where the number, the argument that's inside of the radical, is as small as possible. So could we somehow perform some operations to make the thing that's in the radical less than 12? Is this possible? How could we do it? Um, you could say, just keep it up top 4 times 3. Okay. Times 12 inside the okay. And then... Right? So then you could say, ah, okay, this is square root of 4 times square root 3. And then the purpose of doing that is that, well, square root of 4 is one of the things that we know. Square root of 4 is 2. So this would be 2 square root 3. Okay. Now, what if I was to give you another one? Say like this one. Simplify square root 45. I want to use the same, it's really exactly the same trick. Except I'm going to fumble the trick just a little bit. And I want you to tell me how, I, how I'm fumbling the trick. So the trick on the previous one was that we wanted to factor the thing that was under the radical. Right? So I'm going to do that. I'm going to say, well, isn't this 3 times 15? Right. So it, it, is, it is a perfectly legitimate statement. Yes. 45 is 3 times 15. But this is unhelpful because the point is that we want one of the factors to be a square, a perfect square. 
Okay. So then what would be what would be a better way to factor 45? Nine and five. How about nine and five? So square root of, of nine product five. And then in a sense you could say, ah, nine is a square so it can come out of the radical. And when nine comes out of the radical, what does it come out as? Three, it comes out as its square root. So this, right, this was not what we wanted, but this one, this one was good. Any question about this? <clears throat> this is okay. Okay, how about, how about, um, simplify the square root of x to 8. Hmm. Now I claim to you that this is really the same trick as before. It's really the same trick as before. What you want to do is you want to you want to factor this into something that's a square. So, is there some way we could represent x to 8 as a square? Using the rules of exponents from Friday. Okay, I like that, but then I'm going to represent it as in, in the following way. That this could be written as x to 4 squared. Right? Because that's, this is sort of the line of reasoning that we're talking about. What's the square root of, of 9? It's 3. Because after all, 9 can be written as 3 squared. What's the square root of 49? 7. Because 49 can be written as 7 squared. Well, what is the square root of x to 4 squared? It's x to 4. So I'm going to let you know that I, I, I did something. This is correct. What I've written is correct. But I did something just slightly underhanded. Not really underhanded, but I kept you in a walled garden. And we're going to have to come back to this uh, by the end of th this section because there's, there's a further issue that we have to deal with. Okay, another matter. is that the square root of a divided by b is what? Very good. Square root of a over square root b. And again, there's caveats that this is true when, in the first place, what must be true about a? non-negative. And what must be true about B? Positive. Now wait a second. Why positive? It couldn't, it couldn't be zero because we're dividing. Okay. So then such an example of this is something like uh, the square root of 81 divided by 49. What do you think? Nine over seven, because 
here's one way to see it, is that this is the square root of 81 divided by the square root of 49. Right, the square root distributes to numerator and denominator. And then, square root of 81 is 9, square root of 49 is 7. Any question about this example? Okay. So now, some more radical gymnastics. So how about, uh, I could say, give the instruction, uh, I want you to rationalize, rational, rationalize, the denominator, which is to say, I want you to express without radicals. Uh, so, first example, <coughs> 3 over the square root of 5. So, is it possible to express the square root of 5 without a radical? And the answer is no. You could, you could express the square root of 9 without a radical. How can you express the square root of 9 without a radical? 3, right? It's 3. Can you express the square root of 5 without one, without a radical? No, you need a radical. Okay. So, somehow, we want to we wanna perform a sequence of operations so that there's no more radicals in the denominator. There could still be radicals, just not in the denominator. By the way, I think that this, this is a totally common exercise and I think it's totally silly. I guess is the most charitable word I can use. So let's, let's get the radical out of the denominator. So here's the trick. three over square root five. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna multiply by something, and the only thing you're ever allowed to multiply by is one. Because if you were to multiply by anything else, you'd be changing the, the, the problem. You can't multiply by two, you changed it. You can multiply by one. So the real trick, the real trick is selecting a way to represent one that's as, as convenient as possible. It's as convenient as possible. So here is the trick for this particular kind of exercise. So 3 over square root 5, that's what we were given. And now I'm going to multiply by square root 5 over square root 5. So in the first place, I'd like for you to observe that that red stuff, that's numerically equal to 1. So we haven't changed. We haven't changed the value of what we were given. But this is a c particularly convenient way to represent 1 because when you do this, then the numerator is 3 square root 5 and the denominator is square root 5 squared. Square root 5 times square root 5. Well, what is the square root of 5 all squared? It's 5. So, is it clear that we've satisfied the instructions? Good. So another one. How about if I was to give you <coughs> something like 60 over the square root of 12? So I want you to do the same thing as before. I want you to rationalize the denominator, and I want you to simplify the radicals as much as possible. So what do you think? What should we do? Very good. So 60 over square root 12, that's what we were given. To 
get this to work out by analogy to the previous exercise. We'll multiply by square root 12 over square root 12. So one place where some students get in trouble is they just put a square root of 12 in the denominator. They just, they just put it there. Well, why can't, why can't you, why is that not okay? Why do you need the one up top also? Yeah, you're not allowed to multiply by anything but one. So if you just put a square root of 12 in the denominator, that would be equivalent to taking the expression that you gave me and dividing by the square root of 12. You can't do that. <laughs> it's against the rules. Okay, so then this one is the one that you need, in a sense, to cause the rationalization. But this is the one that you need for bookkeeping pur purposes so that you don't change the expression. Okay, good. So then this would be 60 square root 12 over square root 12 squared. Well, the square root of 12 squared is 12, so this would be 60 square root 12 over 12. Now what can we do? Okay, so I'll do that. I'll do the second thing first. So that'd be 5 square root 12 because 60 by 12 is 5. And then square root 12 can be simplified a little bit. This will be the third time we've done this today, <laughs> I think. So there's a 4 in there, a 4 and a 3. The 4 can come out as a 2. So this would be 10 square root 3. Any question about this one? <coughs> Okay, here's another one, but it's slightly more difficult, and it's, it's more difficult to proceed by analogy than the previous one. So how about, uh, how about um, 18 divided by 4 plus the square root of 3? Okay, now, I'm going to do something, and it's wrong. So, if you're copying what I'm writing, then be prepared to observe that it's wrong. So, if we were to proceed by analogy to the previous two, then you might think, uh, it doesn't look exactly like the other two, but maybe I'll try square root 3 over square root 3. Right, because that's the radical... So maybe this will do it. So will this do it? This won't do it. And let's be clear about why this won't work. The reason why this won't work is because in the numerator we'd have 18 square root 3. And in the denominator, and in the denominator, you would have 4 plus square root 3 square root 3. Like that. then that square root 3, when you distribute it across that sum, you'd have in the numerator 18 square root 3 is unchanged, and then in the denominator 4 square root 3, and then plus 3, because you get a square root of 3, and you get a square root of 3. So does that do what we wanted? So how, how does this not fit the instructions? Yeah, the instructions say rationalize the denominator. There's still a radical there. So in a sense, you know, to anthropomorphize this, it's sort of like saying, well, for the square root of three is now your problem. <laughs> I'll give it to you, and that's your problem. Okay, but this doesn't satisfy the instructions. So this, this is no good. Rather, <clears throat> 18 over 4 plus the square root of 3 
we need to multiply by something else that is equal to 1, but, it's, but square root of 3 over square root of 3 will not do it. So does anyone know what will do it? Almost, not quite. There, that one. 4 minus the square root of 3 divided by 4 minus the square root of 3. So now, this red stuff is equal to 1 because it's crazy thing over itself. So this is 1. Now this is kind of a weird way to write 1, but it's 1. So for now, I'm just going to say that this is a rabbit that is pulled out of a hat. And then I'm going I'm to circle back around and explain why we did this. But for now, just magic. Okay. So if we were to multiply this out, in the numerator it would be 18 multiplied by 4 minus the square root of 3. And in the denominator, 4 plus the square root of 3 multiplied by 4 minus the square root of 3. Okay. <clears throat> so now, I'm going to perform several distributions all at once. This 18 is going to distribute to the 4 and to there. And then I'm going to distribute this whole thing to that 4 and to that one. OK. So performing that distribution, 18 times 4 is 40, 72. <coughs> Seventy-two minus eighteen square root three, and then in the denominator, that would be four plus square root three times four minus four plus square root three times square root three. So, any question about how that distribution occurred, how those distributions occurred? So now I'm going to perform even more distribution. Now this 4 is going to distribute to that, and to that, and this square root 3 is going to distribute to that, to that. <clears throat> so this would be 72 minus 18 square root 3. That's unchanged in the numerator. In the denominator, well, 4 times 4 is 16, and then 4 times the square root of 3, so plus 4 square root 3. And then now we're subtracting 4 square root 3, and we're subtracting square root 3 times square root 3, so minus. And now I'd like to point out something. And that is, we're trying to rationalize the denominator. And look at this waypoint where we're at. Look at all the radicals everywhere. They're like reproducing themselves. Th is this bad or is this, is this good? Ah, let's look. Look at the middle ones. We've got 4 square root 3, positive 4 of them. And then we've got subtract 4 of them. Ah, so the ones in the middle, they cancel. OK. How about the square root of 3 squared? It's just, it's just 3, right? So then, 72 minus 18 square root 3 over 16 minus 3. So something like 72 minus 18 square root 3 over 13. We did it! <laughs> right? Yay! So that is to say, we, we successfully uh, rationalized the denominator. Now, there's still radicals in the numerator. Is that OK? Yeah, according to the instructions. Right? The instructions don't say anything about numerators. Apparently, we only care about denominators. OK. So now, back to this thing. Why this? OK. <clears throat> so this right here is called a conjugate 
conjugate representation of one. So first off, it's a representation of one because numerically it's equal to one. And the reason for, for calling it conjugate is because conjugate, the conjugate, conjugate of the expression a plus b is, well, what is the conjugate of the expression a plus b? a minus b. And it goes both ways, which is to say, what is the conjugate of the expression a minus b? a plus b. So for example, the conjugate of, say, uh, 7 minus the square root of 6 is what? 7 plus the square root of 6. Okay, so now what happens is, is that when you're doing this, when you have expressions that look like this, when you multiply together conjugate representations, when you multiply together conjugate representations, watch what happens. These things in the middle cancel, and then this thing goes away. So that's what happens when you multiply any two conjugate representations. Now, the word conjugate was not chosen at random. Okay, just like the word associate from, from the associative property was not chosen at random. The word, the word conjugate means that two objects are said to be conjugate to each other when they fit together geometrically. So for example, that door has a lock on it. And if the door uh, were locked, how could you unlock it? With a key. So the lock and the key are said to be conjugate to each other because they fit together and when together, that is when the mechanism operates. Similarly, for those of you who, who, have, who have taken or will take biology or chemistry, then you learn about uh, things called catalysts and enzymes. Enzyme is the name of a catalyst in a biological circumstance. What a catalyst does is when you're trying to get two chemical species to react, what literally has to happen in three dimensions is you've got two molecules and they have to come together rotationally to fit together in order for the chemical reaction to proceed. For some, chemi for some chemical species, it can be quite unlikely for them ever to meet each other energetically and in the right orientation, and therefore they won't react. So all an enzyme is, and all a catalyst is, is that there is, a, for example, in, in the case of an enzyme, an enzyme has two at least two locations, and the two chemical species that you want to react, one of them fits in one position in the enzyme, and the other fits in the other position in the enzyme. And then when both of these are, are fitted into the enzyme, the enzyme flexes itself, it, co it contracts, and pulls these two molecules together into the right configuration, and then the, then the chemical reaction occurs. That's all that an enzyme is. Once the new species is created, the enzyme lets go. And then just does this over and over and over again. It's not used up in the chemical process. So that language, that language, the language that's used in biology is lock and key. And that until you get to slightly more advanced biology and chemistry, then they say conjugate. The enzyme is said to be conjugated by species A. And then as soon as it is further conjugated by species B, the reaction will occur. Good. In math, like this. Uh, now. definition of absolute value. So in the first place, given a number, x, a real number, I could request of you absolute value. 
The way it is denoted, denoted is with two vertical bars on either side of the x. This is how it's denoted, and this is how it's defined. So the absolute value of x is x when x is greater or equal to 0. And it is negative x when x is less than 0. So that's the definition of absolute value. So for example, what is the absolute value of 5? It is 5. The absolute value of 5 is 5. Now, I, I'm perfectly willing to accept that most or all of you knew what the absolute value was before you got here. Fine. But according to the definition, according to this definition, I want to know why is the absolute value of 5 equal to 5? Why according to this definition? Five is not Good, right? So then absolute value of 5 is 2 is it de the result depends on the input. So I need to know, am I using this one or am I using this one? So what in, in this particular expression that I gave you, what is x? It, it's, it's 5, not negative. So that means that we must be using that definition. That's why. The thing that you're putting in is non-negative, so it will come back out. Similarly, how about what is the absolute value of 0? Zero. Because zero is non-negative. So again, we're using that definition. And then just out loud, I could say, well, what's the absolute value of 10? 10, OK. Now, what is the absolute value of negative 3? Three? 3. It's 3. But now I want to know why, according to the definition, it's 3. Because it's negative x, and x is negative 3. So if you put a negative on a negative, it becomes positive. OK. So according to the definition, it is negative negative 3. And then, of course, we just call that 3. So the reason why is that for this one, x is negative. So that means that we are using this definition. <coughs> the absolute value of negative 3 is negative negative 3, which is to say 3. I don't, I'm not making a request for you to say negative negative 3. But I want you to see that that's what, that's what the definition is saying. OK. As another example, I could say, well, how about this one? The absolute value of uh, x squared plus 1. How about that? just x squared plus 1, which is to say we can just drop the absolute value. Why? Because we just don't like them, or what? Nothing in the absolute values. OK, let's consider. What about if x was a positive number? If x was a positive number, we'd square it, and it would still be positive. The result would still be positive. Then we'd add 1, and that would be positive. And so it would be positive all, no matter what, if, if we plug in something positive. What if, we oops, what if we plug in a negative x? Negative x squared is still a positive number. Ah, when you square a negative number, the result is positive. <coughs> and then we'd add 1, that'd still be positive. And so that would be fine. What if x was 0? Right, so then you'd square 0 to get 0, and then add 1 to get 1, and it'd be 1. So does everyone see that, ah, <coughs> all, always positive. So that means absolute value has no effect. 
Another matter. What is this? Well, that's negative 10, isn't it? 1 minus 11? So you may be wondering, why is it that I write my ones the way I do? You'll find that a lot of mathematicians write ones in this way. The reason is because this is an ambiguous statement, whereas that can mean only one thing. And this can mean only one thing. That's the reason why I write little hooks on my ones, because they're syntactically meaningful. Last thing for today <coughs> is what is the square root of x squared? It's not x. So I am fully aware that many of you came to this class probably already knowing something about square roots, probably already knowing something about absolute values, and all of that was probably more or less fine, but if you came here to this class believing that this is true, it's not. Okay, so let's go over why, I'm going to modify this in just a moment, let's go over why this is not true. So let's start with 5, square 5, what is it? 25. Now the square root of that? 5. five. Okay. So, so, we started with 5, we ended with 5. Okay, how about 10? What's 10 squared? 100. Square root of 100? 10. We start with 10, we end with 10. How about negative 3 squared? What's that? 9. And what's the square root of 9? 3. So what's the problem? We put in negative 3. Out came positive 3. So the square root of x squared is not x. What is it? Not plus or minus x. It's the absolute value of x. The reason is because what kind of things are allowed to come out of the radical? <coughs> Non-negative things. Negative things can't come out. And only one thing can come out. The radical can't have two things come out. The square root of 9 is not plus or minus 3. That is simply a mistake propagated by your high school teachers. The square root of 9 is 3. And the square root of x squared is the absolute value of x. And I promise that this will come up again and again and again as the semester progresses. Okay, have a nice Wednesday. <laughs>